Welcome to the Standing Up to Pots podcast, otherwise known as the Potscast. This podcast is dedicated to educating and empowering the community about postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, commonly referred to as POTS. This invisible illness impacts millions, and we are committed to explaining the basics, raising awareness, exploring the research, and empowering patients to not only survive, but thrive. This is the Standing Up to POTS podcast. Hello, fellow POTS patients and beautiful people who care about POTS patients. I'm Jill Brooke, your hyperadrenergic host, and today I am honored to speak with two physicians I admire so much as they tell us about an exciting new project that they're working on to help our community. If you're a regular listener, you already know Dr. Tanya Dempsey from our Mast Cell Matters episodes. After training at Johns Hopkins and Cornell, she's now a world-renowned leading expert on MCAS, POTS, immune dysregulation, Lyme disease all the most gnarly, complex, challenging conditions. And you should also know Dr. Leonard Weinstock, gastroenterologist, extraordinaire, research machine, and a world leader in MCAS, IBS, SIBO, and the world of syndromes, which most physicians shy away from, but not Dr. Weinstock. Among other claims to fame, he was among the first to identify that low-dose naltrexone is a huge help to some of us in this community and first to publish on how long COVID may be related to mast cell activation syndrome. Dr. Stempsey and Weinstock, you do so much for this community, and now you are announcing a new project for us. So thank you for being here. And what are you up to? Work. Lots of work. (laughs) Because once you're known in the community, people like to come to you because of the difficulties they find elsewhere. And that's something that Tanya Dempsey and I have struggled with uh, for quite some time, and we were putting our heads together thinking about how do you get other people to learn about it, not only patients and families, but doctors, and how do you get them interested? How do you get them interested? Yeah. Should I speak a little bit? Okay. We are committed to helping this community, to helping patients who don't have answers, need answers need people to take them seriously. We're passionate about helping uh, patients specifically with mast cell activation syndrome and all the syndromes that come with it. And so we are really excited about this opportunity to uh, film a documentary on MCAS. This will be the first documentary of its kind, specifically on MCAS. And we're looking at covering diagnosis, obviously treatment, looking at LDN specifically amongst other things. And, and really, this will be an opportunity to um, educate both the community at large, the public, and the medical providers. And we will be providing presentations and information so that anyone watching this could actually take this information and use it to help others. I can't agree more. I will tell you that we're, you can't talk about MQs and forget about POTS and EDS. And the evil triad, as I like to say, and we also like to say, will be dealt with in this documentary. And it's essential that we train the new doctors before they're jaded by certain groups of people, doctors, and namely, I can't say the names of doctors, but there are groups out there that make it impossible to diagnose MCAP. They don't teach how to diagnose the simple hypermobility changes in people's uh, joints. They barely teach POTS to cardiologists, but nobody else knows about POTS except for some neurologists. And they're a rare breed, the autonomic specialists. So we're excited. And as Dr. Dempsey said, our plans not only is to produce a high quality documentary, but tag along with QV codes and hard links on the internet, educational PowerPoints that will be recorded by the top people in the MCAS, POTS, and EDS world. That is so exciting. So what I'm hearing is that you and some of your cohorts of other top experts, and we've had episodes about the consensus to MCAS diagnostic criteria and why that is important and why it serves patients better. 
And so what I'm hearing is you are making a push to help spread the word and get more physicians able to recognize and treat these patients because there's so many of us and the few of you who do it are, I think, overwhelmed right now. Yeah. yeah. But the reality is that at least 17% of the population has MCAS to some degree, and that it's a spectrum. And maybe that number is really larger, maybe it's 20%. And, and so that's a lot of people out there who, who need help. And sometimes the help is, you know, the milder syndrome, a milder manifestation, sometimes it's more severe. We need more medical providers who can recognize these things. And to, again, to treat 20% of the population, we need a lot of medical providers who are going to be on board, who are going to be able to understand MCAS and then the triad as a whole. And then what I talk about is the septad, which is like the four other associated conditions and now the decad. So seven other conditions associated with the triad. There's just a lot of information and a lot of people who need help. And, and so we want to put that together and provide a way for the, the whole world really to understand this better. Well, I agree about the whole world because I get it that from your perspective, you're excited to share this with other practitioners and to maybe have it shown to medical students as a way to be introduced to this. But I'm actually selfishly excited to show it to family members, to friends, to people who I would love to have understand this better, even though I've already found some physicians who are good at it. So I'm, I'm excited for everybody to get more, more knowledge. Can you talk more? Oh, yeah, I just Lenny. want to dovetail into your statement about family and friends, because it's kind of like a family and friends discount, if you will, because 70% of patients have a positive family history compatible with MCAS. And the genetic and the what we call epigenetic phenomenon of all the toxic things in our world that change and mutate our genes is all part of living together in a toxic world, especially in a household. And um, also sharing genetic risk factors. And so, so many times I hear from my patients, you know, I got to tell my sister about this because you told me that it could be inherited and she's got all the crazy symptoms I do and nobody's ever listened to her. And I hear that over and over, over again. And Dr. Moldering's in a landmark study in 2013 proved it. Right on. And then you had mentioned that there will be QR codes and links that people can follow for further information. Do you maybe want to just emphasize what that yeah. will be? Yeah. So in our complex medical study group, we'll be reaching out to people who have given great lectures at our conferences and basically have them voice over and record over them. And then we'll basically have a mini medical school course. And yet... Just like they have at Washington U where they have a mini medical and all the members of the audience are uh, people wanting you know, to learn more, but they're just lay personnel. Anybody could actually get a lot of things out of it. So it really has different levels. And as long as nobody's talking over uh, anybody's head, uh, everybody would actually benefit from listening to some of these PowerPoint talks. Are you allowed to share the names of any other awesome experts, your colleagues who have agreed to be part of any of this? Tanya, you want to give a sneak preview? Well, well, obviously, the two of us, you, Jill, hopefully will be a part of the documentary. Dr. Uh, Lawrence Afrin, of course, it wouldn't be an MCAS documentary without the world expert in MCAS. Linda and, Bluestein, the yeah. queen of hypermobility, so smart, fantastic uh, speaker, but also a wonderful person who will talk about EDS. And we have a neurologist out of St. Louis who is one of those rare breeds of dysautonomia specialists, who also I'm hoping will discuss some of the complications of EDS neurologically and specifically, but also POTS. Fantastic. So I know that you are partnering with the LDN Research Trust to have this film made. And I believe they've made six other documentaries. I've seen their cancer documentary, and I was actually blown away by how good it was. I learned some 
fascinating things, even though I'm, I'm lucky not to have any cancer in my life. But I made a mental note at the time to say, wow, if anybody I ever know gets cancer, I'm coming back to this documentary. But do you want to tell us a little bit about the LDN Research Trust and why you chose them? Right. Well, it's run by a fantastic person, Linda Ellsgood, who about 20 years ago went to her neurologist and her GP in England and was in a wheelchair because of MS. And they both said to her, you're going to die from this condition. And she, being an attorney and smart and inventive, looked around and found out about LDN, which has been used since 1984 low-dose naltrexone as an anti-inflammatory autoimmune blocker and and other factors, anti-pain, et cetera. And so Linda got on LDN. She relatively rapidly got out of the wheelchair and she established LDN Research Trust to educate people about LDN around the world. And she has done so. She has created documentaries. She has created wonderful resources on the website. And she has agreed to be a fundraiser for this documentary. And you know, I'm, I was at this conference with her recently and bemoaned the fact that we didn't know where to go with this. And as I look back, I presented so many patients at the conferences that had MCAS and presented with something unusual and got better with LDM. And that included this time neuralgia and uh, Tourette's syndrome. Those were my two talks a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, then I met her film producer and we started talking and she said, let's do it. Let's get a documentary together. I'll be the charity fundraiser, which is part of what she does as a dot .org. Um, it's been exciting and things are mounting and now we're just starting to promote because this is not for profit. This is literally to make life better for people. Absolutely. And we're so grateful because we know that you and all the physicians are donating your time to make this happen. And you've been working hard actually for a few years getting this in the works. And so what is the cost to make a documentary like this? And so how much fundraising do we need to do? Well, a lot. Um, to put a high quality uh, film together and with a discount, it would be about two hundred fifty to $300,000. The fact is that Dr. Dempsey talked with her p patient, who's a film maker or a friend of theirs in New York City, where everything costs more, of course. And three years ago, we found out that it would take a million dollars. And we thought, there's no way we could raise a million dollars. But luckily, Rob Jones, who's the producer of this show and others that are on the LDN Research Trust website, does documentaries. And because it's for a charity, um, he does it at a marked discount. So that's what he's willing to do. That's what we hope for, to have a very good quality film. Documentaries usually run 50 to 60 minutes. And we'll be having patients who have been affected by MCAS and PODs interview them, let them tell their story. And we're going to be upbeat. And we're going to look for people who have gotten well because they found the right combination of medications and diet and environment. And Jill Brooks, extraordinary dietitian and patient, survivor, is amazing. And she will hopefully be in a scene where she'll be climbing up a mountain and then voicing over possibly how she got out of the pit that she was in. And I can tell you how she was and you can even read about it in the journal. Just Google MCAS and POTS and our case report will be three or four down. Right, Jill? Yep. You got me out of a deep, deep. Wow. Well, I'm excited to support a documentary like this, partially because I feel like I'm part of a generation that did see how tough it is to 
not just have MCAS, but to have MCAS in a world where very few people recognize it and to kind of give that gift to the next generation of having it be more widely known is exciting. And so I know that today we are hoping that we can get people interested in learning more and maybe considering helping to fundraise, helping to support this. So we're going to put a link in the show notes to the website that has more information about this documentary and the LDN Research Trust and how people can help support it if they wish. Is there anything else we should tell people? This is a way to provide credibility to a syndrome that, and like I said, could be involving, you know, 20% or of the population and it could potentially get worse with the toxic exposures and the things that, that we're dealing with and various traumas. And uh, I mean, the, the list goes on. Lyme disease, COVID. Mold. 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 Absolutely. We're going to cover that in the documentary. We just feel that this needs to get out there. This needs to be made more mainstream so that people recognize this as a real entity. We've never made a movie before, but but we want to make this movie. We feel passionate about it. And whoever can help us get there. And Absolutely. I feel like, you know, in times in history, there were generations that did something for the next generation. And and I look forward to giving future generations so much less of a struggle just to get treatment for something that's not even rare. That's a great point. Well, thank you for saying that. So anything else we should mention? It's, we're really excited about it. We know our patients will benefit from it. I just saw a woman, a nurse practitioner in training last week and called her up tonight with her LTE4 urine test that was abnormal. And we had mentioned, you know, with the review of systems, so many things were positive. And she said to me the, a week ago, you know, I just never wanted to be the complainer. And I haven't been healthy, but I just, yeah, I didn't want to be called crazy because I have all these symptoms. And I told her then, I said, you have MCAS. I mean, you're just screaming it. You've been sick since your childhood. And tonight when I told her, she said, you know, this is actually really relieving to me that I now have an explanation for what's going on. I've had patients who get diagnosed and are in tears. And I say, you know, you're crying and I understand it, but now shed those tears towards something positive because you now have a hope for the future. With the right diagnosis comes treatment and hope. And with more doctors who know about it comes less waiting to get that treatment and hope. So Exactly. So thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for all the time and energy you're putting into this. You guys are just <laughs> amazing for all you do for this community. And it's my hope that we can all step up and support this and make this happen. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay, listeners, that's all for now. We'll catch you again next week. But in the meantime, thank you for listening. Remember, you're not alone. And please join us again soon. As a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast is not medical advice. Consult your healthcare team about what's right for you. This show is a production of Standing Up to Pots, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. You can send us feedback or make a tax deductible donation at www.standinguptopots.org. You can also engage with us on social media at the handle Standing Up to Pots. If you like what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast and sharing it with your friends and family. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts or at www.thepodscast.com. Thanks for listening.